You may have a seat. As you're finding your seat today, would you also find your copy of God's Word and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, one of the things I'm thankful for, uh, I am thankful for Jesus Christ, but uh, I'm also thankful for God's people, getting to be a part of His church, and thankful that the church was a part of uh, God's design from eternity, and that, that was His plan. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about the church. Uh, in fact, the word is a group of two words, ekklesia in the Greek, ek means out of, and kaleo means to call. And so just in the church itself, in the word, you can hear it's the called out ones. That's what makes up the church, those who have been called out of this world by Jesus Christ to himself. And not only that, but we are called to one another. If you look around this room today, for those of us in Christ Jesus or all across here, including myself, we belong to one another. That's what the Bible says. We, we are, uh, it's uh, somewhat of a mystery, but somehow by the Spirit, we belong to each other and we are part of one another. Uh, the, the Bible, uh, specifically our letter, later on, as Paul makes his way towards the end of it, he says that we're the body of Christ. Uh, and we are all members of one body, and we belong to Christ, and we do belong uh, to each other. Now, the Holy Spirit, his role in the Trinity, one of his functions that he does is he applies the work of Christ to our life, ties us to Jesus, but he also ties us to one another because every single believer in this room today has the Holy Spirit living within them, and that Holy Spirit that's in you is no different than what's in me and, and vice, vice versa. And so uh, that's an incredible thing to think about. And uh, if you belong to Jesus, you belong to his church. You are a part of God's church and uh, therefore belonging to one another. The title of this message uh, that I've entitled this is We're on the Same Team. We're on the same team. And I would like for us, with that in mind, as we read this 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as we're going to read some of these verses in here, with the, in the back of your mind, I want you to be thinking this, we are on the same team. And that's true for these that are in this letter. Let's uh, look at our text this morning. It says this in verse 1 of chapter 6. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one? who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Church family, <laughs> we are on the same team. The people, these believers and that Paul is writing to, were on the same team. And you see the, the grievances they're having with one another. And with that in mind, I'd like to point out that Paul is making a, an astonishing argument. This is an astonishing argument that Paul makes. He is astonished by some of these uh, actions. Look, 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 as we look in, back in verse 1, let's just trace his argument. There's uh, like seven questions or so in a row just right here. And Paul is making this argument that he's wanting to uh, point out to them. In verse 1 he says this, Dare any of you, having a matter against one another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Paul is shocked that this is even going on. Because we're on the same team. And so what's shocking about this is not that they're fighting. Um, I mean, uh, churches seem to have these spit spats or whatever. That's not what really he's shocked about. What he's shocked, you can see in the text, is, is that you're going to law before the unrighteous. It's the fact that you're bringing this, your, your, your temper tantrum, whatever's going on, whatever's, he doesn't get specific, and I don't think that's the point. He's just, whatever it is, you're taking this, and I'm not shocked about this, I'm, take, I'm shocked that you are taking this before the unrighteous, and you're not taking it before the saints, the believers. And so he's shocked at how they're handling these matters. And uh, this is what's chapped Paul. 
The issue is not what's chapped Paul. What's chapped Paul is that you've taken it before the unrighteous. Now, the unrighteous is not describing the Roman pagan law system. He's not saying that that law system is unrighteous. He's saying the people are unrighteous. Right? And so the unrighteous is referring uh, to the lost people that you are bringing it in front of, not this Roman kind of system. Now, a lost person, the unrighteous is what he's, what he's speaking of, a lost person, their view of what is right and wrong is skewed. They have no frame, correct frame of reference which to see a situation and see it right or wrong in God's sight. And so uh, they do not know the Lord Jesus. They don't have the Holy Spirit living within them like, like the saints, like the believers do. Like you and I do, if you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. A lost person does not have that. And what's chapped Paul is he says, you have these issues and you are taking it before people. Here's the irony. The people that don't know right and wrong and the people that do know right and wrong are taking it before those who don't and having them tell them what's right. It's backwards, right? You see that you see the problem that's that's messed up. And that's what's chapped Paul in this. And this is what he's uh, concerned about. And he's saying the matter should be handled before those who do know what's right, who do have God's wisdom, who can see a situation, who know Jesus Christ, who know the Bible, and could and give some correct advice should be. And uh, that's what's shocking. This is this astonishing argument here that Paul is making is uh, and you're taking this before unbelievers, and that's not good. But this isn't just an old, um, you know, problematic issue. I'm telling you, people still do this today. They want what God, what, what would be uh, wisdom for their marriage, you know, what, you know they're, they're looking for uh, wisdom in their finances, they're looking for wisdom in all these issues and areas of life, and guess whose voice gets to speak into that? A lost friend, a lost co-worker. The church is where you should be able to get that. Someone who can, a, a believer who loves you, who will point out this is what God says and may even tell you something that's kind of hard, but because they love you would tell you the truth. But people today still do this. And I'm just telling you, a lost person does not know what is right or wrong in God's sight, and that's often where people seem to run. Well, if you're unhappy with your marriage, just, you know, just end it. Just, just leave them. I'm telling you, that's not advice that you would get from the Bible. Or, uh, you know, just uh, cheat a little bit on your, your taxes a little bit. That's just a little white little thing, you know. That Look, I'm telling you, a lost person, the unrighteous, will tell you outside of what is in God's Word. And the people that do know, should know, and should be the ones telling this, is the saints, the believers. And Paul's saying, what in the world? This is what's chapped me is that you've taken this before the unrighteous and you have not brought this before the saints, before the church. And so uh, with that being said, so this very first question he gives is he's, we're going to trace this argument he makes. And so there's a bunch of questions that follow, but each one is tied to this very first one. Okay, so as we're going to read each of these questions, this argument that he begins to make, it flows from this very first one he asks, and they're all connected to one another. And they get even more shocking. There's even more shocking. I mean, if you look at the next one in verse 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? I mean, so here's another kind of shocking uh, announcement. So he says uh, 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 that that the saints are going to judge the world. You're going to take your issue before an unrighteous, a lost person, who one day you may even stand before in judgment. That doesn't make sense, right? And so uh, he says, do you not know that the saints will one day judge the world? And when he says this, this next question, uh, the world is lost people. He's not talking about the cosmos, the, the earth. You're gonna, it's talking about lost people. And he's, when he says, we'll judge, that one day you will judge this, he's talking about a judgment that is going to happen in the future. We'll judge in the future. And so he's talking about on a final day when that judgment's going to uh, come down, uh, God's people will be with, with the Lord somehow involved in, in this judgment uh, that's going on. In fact, you get a, a very clear picture of this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Let me read this for you. It says this in verse 9 of Daniel chapter 7. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. 
His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. That's an incredible image right there. And in fact, you can see this is also what the Apostle John describes as Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. In verse 10, he says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Here's where you're going to get the the scenario. A thousand thousands ministered to him. So there's those who are ministering to this ancient of days. And then this next part, 10,000 times 10,000. That's a lot bigger number than the first one, right? And if you'll recall, Jesus is saying there's going to be many who are going to go through the wide gate. But narrow is the way, and few are those who will go through the narrow gate. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now, if you're standing before someone, you're not standing with someone. They are standing in judgment. In fact, the next part proves that. The court was seated, and the books were open. And so we get this peek into this final judgment. This fi- and I'm saying this is the final courtroom, because after this judgment, no more sin needs to be judged, because all that ish goes in to the, to the, uh, the new heaven and new earth will not be marred by sin at all. Sin will have already been condemned. This is the final court scene that you will see that takes place, and somehow believers are going to be involved in this. That's pretty shocking, right? These same people who are having these issues, right, that should be, if they're going to be involved in that somehow, shouldn't they be able to handle the small stuff within their daily lives that haven't taken it before the lost people who one day they might see in this final judgment? That's uh, another point of irony. And so that's what we see back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, when he says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world one day? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now when he says small, he's speaking of insignificant, uh, the least important. Uh, Compared to that judgment one day that will come, compared to the scheme of all things, isn't it pretty small what, what the fights get over? I mean, I would say they're all these little tippy tappies. They're all a little insignificant. Compared to all that matters, compared to the grand scheme of things, it's all pretty small. And this is what Paul, as he's making this astonishing argument, this is what he's getting them to try to see. Do you not know that you're one day going to judge the world? And if that's true, then shouldn't you be able to handle stuff in-house without taking it before a Roman governor at the Bema seat and letting him speak into your life? And so that's the issue. That's the deal. And so... He goes uh, flowing from that. And if the world would be, would be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? That's another shocking thing, right? Now it's getting bigger. And as this is getting bigger, guess what's getting smaller? Those issues. Those issues that they're fighting over. That's what Paul is doing. He's, he's shocking them so that they can see this. And uh, this angels, let's try to deal with this. Um, so this is referring again to a final judgment. This is written in the future tense, will judge the same way with, so somehow, uh, I don't know how it's all going to play out, but just like in Daniel seven, nine through 10, we see that there are, there's those standing before him. Well, guess what? His angels that have fallen that have, and, and their ringleader, guess what? They will also stand before God in judgment and be casted out of God's presence as well. Now I'm not looking forward to seeing lost people go to hell. I'm not looking for that day. In fact, that day is going to make us weep. Because if you look in Revelation, it's after the white throne judgment that you see God wiping away tears from our eyes. The reason why we're crying is because we just saw loved ones, maybe even family members, go to a place that was not prepared for them. Go to a place that was prepared for Satan and his angels. I'm not looking forward to seeing that day. In fact, that breaks my heart. However, I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Satan go in. I wouldn't mind seeing the one who's deceived all of them. I'm not going to care about that. In fact, I kind of hope I get to see that, to be honest with you. I don't mind seeing that. But it will break our hearts seeing those stand before God who loved them, who made a way for them, who sent his one and only son to die on the cross for them, had a plan and purpose for their life, and that they rejected it. That's going to break our hearts, church family. It is. And so he says, one day you're going to judge angels. So again, if we're some going to have, somehow be involved in this judgment as we're ministering to God, as this is taking place, as we're standing with him, as we're seeing all this go down, he says, if you're going to be involved in this, guess what's now really, really small? That little issue you had with old brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. It don't matter, right? If that's, if that's what's going on, it does not matter. It's small. Now, I don't know what the issue was, but, you know, maybe it's, you know, old brother Joe, you know, old brother Bobby stole the hubcap off of 
the chariot wheel of old sister so-and-so or whatever, and uh, all this is going on. And then guess what? They got this insignificant issue, right? And maybe old deacon so-and-so helped them do it. And old sister so-and-so back there is gossiping all about what happened. And as they take all this before a Roman governor, and as they're taking it before a Bemis seat, as he's going to pronounce it, and as that Roman governor's seeing this, and maybe some other lost folk around there watching the church bring their issue to them, what does that communicate to them? Does that not look ridiculous? You see why it should be handled in-house within the saints? Because what are you telling them? This is the condemnation that Paul is having, and he's astonished. He's shocked, not at the issue, but the way the issue is being handled, taking it before unbelievers. And I'll tell you, it's all silly. That's a silly illustration, but all the arguments, I tell you, you boil them down, and the scheme of grand scheme of things, they are silly, and they don't matter. Can you give me that at least? Are they not silly? You can make this as hard on you as you want to. Is it not silly? It is silly, and I'm telling you that the church, uh, we can get this handled without having to take it before uh, lost folk and have them speak into it. Now, the next set of questions here that we're going to look at, it's going to get even more shocking, uh, I believe. Now he says uh, in verse 3, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? What he's saying is least esteemed by the church. Uh, This is speaking of not of those least esteemed in-house, but least esteemed out there who have no standing in the church, who have no standing in God's family at all, right? They have not had their soul redeemed or saved or any of those things, and you're taking these issues uh, before them. And so least esteemed is speaking of the lost people, these Gentile judges who have no standing in the church or have no business even get to speak of these issues. Uh, that's a shocking reality, but I'm just telling you, there, a lost person should have this much influence in your life, in my life, and in the life of the church, right? Only God knows his plan for his, his people, his church, and then to allow a lost person who, do, who cannot uh, see right from wrong from God's sight, who has everything skewed, to allow them to speak on that is uh, absolutely uh, absurd. And that's what he is saying. You appoint those at least as seen by the church to judge. I say this to your shame. He says you should be embarrassed. That's what he's saying. I'm not giving you a compliment on all this. I'm saying this to your sh- You should be embarrassed by what's happening here. And I'll tell you, if we're doing the same thing, then guess what? We should be embarrassed that we are even doing that. You should be, if, if, if you are the one that's going to that lost friend saying, hey, I need some advice, help me. You should be ashamed for these reasons right here. That's a, a shocking reality. Uh, and so we're handling, we, we go through the same things today. And he says this, is it so that there is not one wise man among you? Not even one. I mean, isn't there one wise person in the church that could handle this? I mean, don't, don't you got at least one, somebody in there, one wise man that can speak into that? If not, that's embarrassing, right? If there's not at least one person in that church, gather, that, in this gathering at Corinth, that would be embarrassing. But I have a feeling there probably was. There might have been, and it may not just been spoken up. They might have just been like, oh, well, you know, I'm just sitting back. God gives the church leaders, uh, uh, gives leaders to the church, uh, I believe, for a reason. There should have been at least uh, one. Is there not one wise person that could have handled this? And I'll just tell you, uh, that's astonishing. If you got Brother Bob and Brother Joe, Brother who, Brother whoever, and they're 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 in this tippy tap, and then go up before a Roman governor and say, "Hey, uh, he did this to me," and he said, "Well, he started it," and the other one's pointing, and what did we do? That's embarrassing. That's, that's really embarrassing. That's embarrassing for the church. And it's absurd and it's astonishing that that would even take place. Now, there's kind of a tippy tap going on right now. If you've paid attention to the news with the, the NFL, I don't know if you've seen the Jerry Jones, Roger Goodell deal. I mean, it's hard to miss that, right? There's a, they've got a tippy tap going on. And guess what? It's getting brought out for the public, and so we're getting to see all this. But do you think Jerry Jones or Roger Goodell is going to come ask you or me what to do? No, that'd be absurd, right? Hey, uh, pastor, can you tell us what to what to do? And uh, he started it, and you know, just hug it out. You know, y'all. 
They're not going to ask me what to do because I don't know. I don't know the business. I don't know. If, it would be just as absurd if they went and asked somebody who has never even heard of football. Maybe a foreigner who doesn't even know the ins and outs of business or any of those. That would be absurd, right? I mean, even they would tell you, that person has no right speaking into my situation. That would be coming from a lost person, right? I'm telling you the same is true for the church. It's just as absurd for Jerry Jones to come ask us what to do as it is for the church to go ask a lost person, what do I do with my marriage? What do I do with my family? What do I do with my kid who's going astray? What do I do with my life? How can I be saved? It's just as absurd as that, I assure you. A church needs to handle stuff within the body of Christ. The saints, we belong to one another. And guess what? We are on the same team. And if you can remember that, that'll also dilute some of those problems that you're having with the person in the pew sitting next to you. When you realize we're on the same team, all that stuff is small and insignificant. So he's got this astonishing argument. Now we're going to look at some astonishing actions. Look with me back in verse 7. He says this, Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. So this is action, what's shocking about this is that everyone loses on the team because of this. He says, it is already another failure for you. You there is plural. And as I heard Tony Evans say this week, if he was speaking in Texans, he would say y'all. It's already another failure for y'all. I'm talking of you plural, everybody. Everybody's lost because of brother so-and-so and and brother so-and-so getting into it. It's an utter failure for you already. And he's going to go on and uh, explain why. He says that you would go to law against one another. Guess who gets the victory? The church loses, but who gets the victory? Satan himself. He's the one that gets the victory in all this. He's the one that rejoices and celebrates over this. If he can get a church doing this kind of stuff, Satan's laughing, I assure you. And we lose. He's the one that seems to get the victory in these kind of things. And what does it communicate to a lost judge in Corinth? What would that communicate as they've got their little tippy tap going on and they're going to go up and approach a Roman governor? What does that communicate to them? I don't want to be a part of that. Guess what all the other lost people see? My goodness. That's what goes on in the church. That's what y'all been meeting about. That's what all this stuff's been going on. And y'all got all these people coming to your house and gathering for worship. That's what all that's about. No thanks. Don't want no part of that. And I wouldn't blame them. It's hard to reach people for Christ when division is spreading throughout God's people. Everybody loses. Every single person and the one who loses is the team. Everybody gets affected by this stuff. Everybody does. And the team loses even if it's just a couple. Well, why do you say that? Because somehow we are all connected and members of one another. By the Spirit of God, we are in a family. Somehow that's even hard to explain, but that's what it affects everybody. Surely you could have seen that last week with sin in the camp, right? The same is true of with this stuff that's going on. Jesus wanted his people to show the world something worth being a part of. In John 13, 34, he says this, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. And by this, the entire world will know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. That's what they should be seeing. I'm telling you, a lot of that stuff can be handled by just loving each other. By just loving one another. That can handle that. Jesus also said if the salt loses its flavor, it's good for what? Nothing. It's good for nothing. These people lost some of their saltiness, did they not, when they went up there? Let me tell you this. Some of you have lost some of your saltiness. If all you, if you, all you got to do is gossip, complain, and do stuff, guess what? You've affected the whole team, and the whole team has lost some of its saltiness, if that's you. Look, if you've got a tippy-tap with a person in the pew sitting across from you, handle that because the whole team is affected by it, I assure you. And it's an utter failure for all of us. Sometimes it comes from the people that you wouldn't even expect. Sometimes it can even come from the elderly folk who should have the most salt and season in their life. And it seems like even some of y'all elderly folk, and I ain't calling y'all old, I ain't trying to be mean, but I'm telling you this, you gossiping behind people's back, are you doing this? Those who should be setting the best example have the most salt and season in their life. And the ones you would think who want the church to come to life the most 
the ones that have been here for a long time are shooting your own team in the foot by gossiping and doing all that mess. The whole team is affected by it. And uh, speaking of y'all, we, we all losing. Everyone loses when the team members fight. Everybody does. It doesn't help anybody. Paul says this, it's just better to just accept the wrong. Just to accept the wrong. Look what he goes on to. He says in verse 7, the second part, Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Even that would be better than what you're doing. Just turn the other cheek. But he says, no, y'all doing the slapping. Y'all are slapping the cheeks. He says this in verse 8, No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. You are doing this to your brother and sister in Christ. You see what he's doing? Now he's getting chapped about this stuff a little bit. I mean, he's chapped the way it's handled, but he's saying, by this already happening, it's already an utter failure for you. Everybody has suffered because of this. And just accepting the wrong is clearly better than fighting each other. Fighting the one whom Christ died for. And let me put this in perspective for you. That person you don't like. Or that person that's giving you a hard time right now. That person, maybe it's in the pew next to you. That's, you need to see them as this. That is one whom Christ died for. That is your brethren. That is your sister. That is your brother in Christ. That makes it a little bit smaller now, doesn't it? That issue. Hopefully these issues get a little bit smaller when you see it in the grand scheme of things. And it gets kind of astonishing when you see it like this, right? And it gets kind of shocking. I also say this, just to speak to this, God will fight your battles for you if you will let him. I found, though, when I try to do something, I tend to mess it up. And it takes an entire lifetime to get fixed, maybe even 10,000. But God can do more in a millisecond if you would just let him take care of that and leave the vengeance stuff up to him. Maybe so-and-so did wrong you. Maybe so-and-so did whatever. Let God handle that and just love them. I believe that's what he's saying when he's talking about turning the other cheek kind of stuff. I mean, obviously, he's not talking about self-defense. Uh, obviously, I ain't a pacifist anyway, but, uh, I mean, that was an insult. Maybe you've been insulted. Maybe you've been wounded a little bit. Just give that to God and let him handle that as opposed to fighting one another and then even worse, taking it out in the public square and letting a lost person uh, handle that. It's ridiculous. Now, maybe some of y'all are going to go watch football a little bit later today. Now I'm on the football subject, and maybe your team's going to be playing later. What if you went, you sat on your couch, and you, you know, you're feeling good, got the fan on, and, man, you're ready, you're, you got out of your dress clothes, now you're in your comfy sweatpants, and whatever you do, and you're laying there, and you're ready to watch, you turn on TV, watch your team, and all of a sudden, the team that was wearing the same colored jerseys comes out, and instead of fighting the other team, what would you do if they just started fighting one another? That would look pretty crazy, would it not? Especially in front of all the spectators that are watching, not just in the stadium, but everyone that's watching on their television. I mean, you'd be like, this is ridiculous. Y'all can't get it together. You're supposed to be fighting them. That's not your enemy, right? And not only that, but even the coach or the owner might get some shame brought on them, right? Because that, that kind of reflects look, looking bad, like, hey, man, what, get your people together. Look at what they're doing. I wonder what the lost world thinks when the church does the same thing, when the spectators gather out there and when we leave these doors. Maybe it's not on the TV. Maybe it's through the workplace or your neighbor, whatever it is. But we got spectators, I assure you, and people are watching. And they have a right to, if we're, if we're willing to claim the name of Jesus, we, we, they have a right to do that, to see if what we have and what we claim is real. And it should be that they would see that and see our good works and then glorify our God in heaven. I mean, that's what Jesus, you're a city on a hill, a light to God, all the lost to me. But guess what? Our light gets messed up when the whole team starts turning inward and going on one another. And it looks just as ridiculous. And I'm telling you this, we got the same white garments. We're not wearing jerseys, but we got white garments. And guess who gave us those? The owner. And guess what? When we start treating each other bad, right? The one who Christ died for, the one who ends up getting a black eye or gets reproach brought on is Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, friends, I don't, I don't want no part of that. I hope you don't either. But it brings reproach upon him and his church. And uh, that's what we show a lost world. But we can't win or be effective. Everybody loses. Let's just remember this. Can we all agree that we're on the same team? That person uh, that may be kind of chapping you right now or that person in the pew next to you, 
can't you at least come to agreement that we're on the same team? And that our enemy, he, the devil, Satan, he is the one that we're in war against, not each other. But we make it a lot easier on the opponent when our team gets together to, to go to battle and then we turn on one another. We made it a lot easy on Satan. In fact, that other team can kind of just chill out for a little bit. It's pretty easy. <laughs> Look at them. Fortunately, I think that's what Satan does. So we have these astonishing argument, astonishing actions. And bring us to this last one, an astonishing anatomy. Look in verse 9. He says this, kind of doing another argument here, asking questions. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I mean, do you not know, all right, those people that you're going in front of, don't, don't, don't you not know that the unrighteous, they're not going to inherit this? The unrighteous is speaking uh, of lost people, right? Those who have not been saved, those who do not know Jesus Christ. One day they're not going to receive the inheritance of the kingdom of God. What the, uh, what the team members are going to inherit, they're not going to inherit that. Because they ain't on the team, right? You've got to be on the team to inherit the benefits of the team. And one of the benefits of the team of Jesus Christ is you inherit the kingdom of God. But those who aren't on the team don't get that. He says, do you not know that? He says, don't be deceived. And here's our command. Do not be deceived. Satan is the deceiver, right? So guess who's the one doing the deceiving? (laughs) It's him. Satan is the one who would seek to convince someone that they're going to be okay in the end. And so as we're going to go through this list in a moment, I want you to understand. Satan is going to try to put a veil over your eyes. He's going to try to deceive you. If these are a part of your life, you do need to be concerned. Okay? You do need to be. And Satan would be the one to deceive you to think, now I know what that preacher's saying, but just check out for a little bit right now, and you're going to be all right. That's what a deceiver would tell you. But I want to tell you the truth of what God would say. And so let's look through these uh, descriptions as Paul gives this list and clarifies what he means by the unrighteous. So he says, don't be deceived. Here's the list. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what I meant when I said unrighteous. None of these on this list are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Let's kind of break this down. Fornicators, speaking of uh, a prostitute, unlawful sexual intercourse is what this is speaking of. Idolaters, worshiping something else besides God, where something besides God becomes the object of your worship. Adulterers, sleeping with the spouse of another, breaking the marriage covenant, right? And then homosexuals, that that word actually means the word refers to those who submit to homosexuality or homosexuals. Sodomites is is where he's actually talking about those who are living in the homosexual lifestyle. Then he says thieves, one who steals from another. Covetousness, eager to have more than they have. They covet what belongs to someone else, what, what you have isn't good enough. Drunkards, one who can't put down the drink. Revilers, speaking bad about others and abusing them verbally. Extortioners, attaining something in an unjust way. None of these things on that list will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, And Satan would deceive any person that's on this list that, no, you're going to be all right. And the result is, because they're not in the family, they're not going to inherit a family inheritance. What they'll inherit is the one who deceived them, his inheritance which is the eternal lake of fire. But I'm going to tell you this, every single person on this list can be a part of the family. That's the good news. But Satan would deceive you to say, you know what, I know that's part of your life, but but, but don't don't worry about that. Just, just, uh, you know, kind of forget what you just heard. But he's, he's the deceiver. He would tell you that. And Paul says this in verse 11, and such were some of you. Some of you people... Some of you are like this. This tells you the anatomy of the church. That's an astonishing anatomy, is it not? That's what God has done. That shows you how much God loves and how much he's willing to go get in the gutter. Someone who is in this list, right? And then clean them up. In fact, he goes on to say, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This shows you that there ain't no mess too messy that he can't clean up. In fact, the writer of this letter murdered one of the very first deacons. If you go to Acts chapter 6, you, uh, they, they elect some deacons. One of them, his name is Stephen. He stands up and preaches a sermon. Guess who was governing over, presiding over his murder? The one who wrote this letter. Paul. Guess what? He's been washed though. He's been sanctified. He's been forgiven. Washed means all the dirt, the sin has been removed. 
And then he says, so you've been washed, you were sanctified, made holy. You weren't holy, but you've been made holy. All of these are past tense, by the way. You were this. That list for a believer, guess what? That should be in the past tense. That shouldn't be in the present. If it's in the present tense, that should be wrong. There's something wrong. We need to go back, repent, and ask for forgiveness. He says, such were some of you. And then here comes the first past tense of verb. You were washed. Jesus Christ washed your sins away. You were sanctified. You were made holy. You couldn't do that on your own, so Jesus Christ made you holy. And he sets you apart for his special purpose. So he brings you in the family, washes you up, cleans you, and then once you're in the family, you're on the team, then you have a specific function on the team that no other team member can do but you. So he sanctifies you. And then he says, you were justified. You were made right in God's sight. Justified means declared right. You are declared before God holy. And the only one that can do that is Jesus Christ. And he says, this is done in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus Christ, there is no way you can get on the team except through Jesus Christ. And guess what? Everyone's welcome. Everyone is welcome on the team. It doesn't matter how bad your past is. Paul is a perfect example. You can look and look what Paul has done in the New Testament. In fact, we're preaching through his letter this morning. That just shows you do not let your past dictate what God can do in your future. It doesn't matter. It can be forgiven. But here's the key. All those things, they need to be past tense. If those are present tense, guess what? That does quench out what God wants to do. But that same forgiveness and washing you received at first for a Christian, it happens on a daily basis. In fact, every single day I've got to go back and let Jesus wash me and cleanse me. Please help me be effective again today for you. I confess, I repent of what I did or what I thought, all those things. And because you're on the team, you got access, and it's team members only. You got access to the very throne room of God, and you can do that. But if you do not, or if you're not on the team, then guess what? You need to get on the team, and everyone's, everyone, the call goes out to every single body, whoever, whosoever will come, and you can be on this team. In fact, that's what we're going to do right now as we get ready for this last song as we prepare uh, for our uh, invitation. I'd like to uh, extend a call for you that maybe you've never been a part of anything in your life. Maybe for you, you know, uh, there's always seemed to be in rejection. But I'm telling you, regardless of what you've done, you can be welcome and accepted and loved in the sight of Jesus Christ today. Do not leave today without knowing that. I don't, know, I don't care what it's been. He will clean you up. And he's in the business of doing that. And I invite you today, as we get ready to pray for this invitation song, you say, you know what, I know I'm not on the team. My plea for you is get on the team. Because that judgment we spoke of earlier, that is coming. And I love you enough to tell you that. Satan would love to deceive you and say, don't worry about that. You've got, always got time. That's something that comes out of the deceiver's mouth. That comes out of straight out of the pit of hell that you always have more time. You do not. The Bible says that the day of salvation is now. And do not put that off. If you know you're not on the team, get on the team today. Don't leave today without putting your faith, your trust, your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. And he'll accept any repentant heart that comes uh, his way. Church family, I also make another plea to you. Are we fighting one another? We're on the same team. In fact, I can remember uh, back in high school uh, going to a, uh, a basketball game and we're traveling over there and a fight broke out on the bus. I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and one of the kids got punched in the eye. And uh, anyway, it, it kind of got settled down. But by the time we got there to play our opponent, <laughs> we, were, we were already defeated. <laughs> I mean, we done got into it. One dude shows up. He's sitting on a bench. His eyes already black. It already puffed up. And, uh, I mean, it was just, and we're all wearing the same color jerseys. We're on the same team. And we made it really easy on that opponent. How many of us have been wounding one another and we're on the same team? How many of us have these same white garments on and yet we're wounding each other? Maybe you, you've already come to Christ but you've got some stains. Maybe you've stained up that white garment a little bit. And I'll tell you this, you can come back to the Lord Jesus Christ today and guess what? He will wash you again. He will clean you up again. 
Maybe he's bringing that wound to your mind. You need to come confess that. Maybe you need to confess to a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe the team needs to get right with each other today. And if we don't, we will never be effective out there if we can't be effective in here. We are on the same team, and we need to get it together in here. I want more than anything to see this church do incredible things for God. I do. I pray for that every day. But I believe an utter failure has already happened. And until that gets right, until we can get right with one another, until we can treat each other and love one another, we'll never show a lost world anything worth being a part of. I pray that today you would see that importance. And if God's bringing something to your mind, you would respond today. We're on the same team. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as we get ready to sing this next song, I invite you. We'll have staff at the front. If you need to come and pray, talk to one of us. If you are not on the team and you need to make a decision to be on the team, come down today and we'll help you get on the team of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to come get some of these stains washed off. You need to confess that before the Lord and he'll do that. Maybe you need to go to one another right now. However God would lead, let's respond to him. Our Heavenly Father, God, I ask that you would do something amazing in these next few moments. God, I ask that you would move in our hearts. God, I pray that you would replace the fear with courage for those who need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today, that they would not be deceived by the deceiver. I pray that today that the team would get right with one another today. God, I pray for revival in this place. I pray that today the team would begin loving one another. God, I pray you would have your way with your people today. Lord, would you speak to us? Would you move as only you can? We give these next few moments to you. God, would you just do something awesome? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to respond today, I invite you to come forward. If you need to make a decision today, come forward. If you need to be a part of a team and you want to be a part of a team, a church family, I invite you to come and we'll take care of those details and welcome you into our team today. But as we sing, won't you come?